The words of author Louise Benson linger in my mind. She writes, When we find it difficult to comprehend the deaths of five million people, numbed as we are to huge-scale loss, it can take an impossible image to finally break us beyond the fog of unseeing. I'd always been told that it's wrong to aestheticize war, and of course, for good reason. Aestheticization can weaponize images for propaganda by romanticizing or glorifying that which ought not to be. It can cause the truly grim reality of war to be hidden in the eyes of the viewer, dangerously warping our perception of it. So, of course, it's unsurprising that I've always accepted the wrongness of aestheticizing war as a concrete truth. It was only until recently, though, when I was working on a documentary that engaged with the topic of war and I was forced to ask myself, am I aestheticizing this subject matter, that I realized there was a lot I didn't understand on the topic. The precise definition of aestheticization is to depict as being pleasing or artistically beautiful, to represent in an idealized or refined manner. And so my instinct was to avoid this at all costs, because of course war is not beautiful, and so I did not want to take a moral misstep in treating the visual material I was using in a way that either triggers viewers who have experiences with war or misrepresents to a counterproductive degree the reality I was seeking to document. But reflecting on the above definition, I might take issue with the use of the word beautiful, because does not each individual have a unique unconscious feeling as to what is beautiful and what is pleasing? And so, in that sense, who truly decides what has been aestheticized? A big influence for the documentary I was making was Adam Curtis's films, such as Hypernormalization and Can't Get You Out of My Head. These films, like most of his work, are almost entirely assembled from archive and internet videos and exhibit quite bold artistic choices through editing and sound. This style he uses creates a kind of hypnotic experience which engulfs the viewer in a powerful way and so I wanted to emulate this. But in my case, to make such bold artistic choices with footage of an ongoing war runs a very strong risk of aestheticization and I of course did not want to create harm with the documentary or be counterproductive to the overall cause I was trying to shine a light on. That being said, I had seen bold artistic choices made documenting war in the past, and so although I knew it would be a difficult tightrope to navigate, it was possible. Photographer Richard Moss, for example, is perhaps most famous for his documentary images of the conflict in the Congo, and what was unique about his approach was that he used a discontinued military film stock which changed the color green to pink, resulting in images which were both dreamy and haunting, and so, in the eyes of many, I would imagine strangely beautiful. The work went on to find wide publicity and praise for its sensitive portrayal of the ongoing tragedies in the country. As Benson writes, Moss's Congo refused to conform to the traditional tropes of empathy and stoicism that haunt wartime imagery. It is heretic in its melding together of a feminized color with a masculine scene of war. And so for me, after reading this and after researching deeper into the reception of his work, I admit it was encouraging to see such positive responses and such respect for and understanding of the artist's intentions. That being said, I couldn't help but question whether this admiration was rooted in the underlying message or purely in the enjoyment of the artistry. The root of this question came from this curiosity of whether or not arresting imagery such as this could actually translate into tangible change, or does it merely serve as a transient fascination? Honestly, I don't know, but of course it does force people to look, even if just for a moment, and in this case I would argue that that is better than the imagery never existing. But is it always this way? 
For instance, I recently saw a clip on YouTube in which two climate activists were on a panel show attempting to communicate the dangers the planet is facing when the host interrupted them to tell them that what they were saying was for another debate, as that day they'd been invited onto the program to discuss the methods of their activism, not the message. That's not why you two were booked on this show. You two were booked on this show because the methods that you're using are now damaging your cause they are actually deterring the public from supporting you. I think what you're doing is alienating a public who might well be persuaded. But at the moment, they think you're a bunch of annoying twerps wrecking their lives. And so the question remains in my head, does forcing attention on issues irrespective of method always further the cause positively? I wouldn't personally place Richard Moss's images from the Congo in this category of counterproductive methods, but I would place it in the category of aestheticization. Because when I think back to the definition of aestheticization to depict as being pleasing or artistically beautiful, to me it's a no-brainer that it is truly a beautiful body of work. And so, in my mind, I can't help but feeling that this above definition of aestheticization is false, or the process of aestheticizing war is not as inherently wrong as widely believed. For this documentary I'd been working on, we'd been exclusively interviewing people in Berlin initially, but eventually we traveled to Ukraine to document some of the sites of destruction there. But it wasn't until the first day of shooting in Ukraine when I first turned on my camera that I realized I really didn't know how to shoot what I was seeing. My professional background is in fashion marketing primarily, and so for the past decade nearly, my photographic efforts have been centered around creating appealing images, and this just didn't feel appropriate here. I tried at first to simply shoot what I was seeing free from an artistic lens, but when I would pause to view the footage, I couldn't help but find appealing what I had shot. But we were on a schedule these days, and I didn't really have much time to reevaluate my shooting style, so I just allowed the compositional muscle memory to kick in and just shot how I knew. At the same time, I couldn't help feeling uncomfortable in this knowledge that I was capturing images of these sites of suffering that I actually found appealing. It was only on the 45-hour train back from Kiev to Berlin when I discovered a passage from Susan Sontag's regarding the pain of others that my discomforts were settled somewhat. Sontag writes, that a gory battlescape could be beautiful in the sublime or awesome or tragic register of the beautiful is a commonplace about images of war made by artists. The idea does not sit well when applied to images taken by cameras. To find beauty in war photographs seems heartless, but the landscape of devastation is still a landscape. There is beauty in ruins. Photography that bears witness to the calamitous and the reprehensible is much criticized if it seems aesthetic, that is, too much like art. But photographs tend to transform whatever their subject, and as an image something may be beautiful, or terrifying, or unbearable, or quite bearable, as it is not in real life. For me, this passage perfectly encapsulated my tension with the general ideas around aestheticization because it recognizes that, of course, images which represent suffering can sometimes contain beauty. The mere presence of this beauty, though, does not forgive the oppressors, nor belittle the victims, nor seek to evoke mindless pleasure of the viewer. And most importantly, I believe it does not, by definition, dilute the severity of the subject matter. Rather, I believe in some cases an experiential appeal can helpfully illuminate severity in a way that is simply not possible through other means. And so perhaps the challenge is in finding the equilibrium, of harnessing the potency of imagery without diminishing the gravity of the subject, of recognizing the transformative potential of art whilst meticulously navigating the ethical quagmire of representation. To reiterate the words of Louise Benson, Numbed as we are to huge scale loss, it can take an impossible image to finally break us beyond the fog of unseen.